Welcome to the SaaS Revolution Show. I am your host, Alex Thuma, CEO founder of SaaStock. Delighted to be joined today by Lloyd Lobo. Lloyd is the co-founder of Boast, which uh, uh, during the time of Boast, uh, Lloyd sort of raised, I think, almost uh, 100 million of, of growth and, and venture-backed capital. It was originally bootstrapped uh, before he got into the, the, the private equity and, and, and VC track. A lot of interesting comments uh, uh, around that. Also, Lloyd is somebody I, I've known uh, as the founder of the Traction Conference and Community. He has over 100,000 members in Vancouver. Lloyd, Lloyd did mention that. I did register once for that, but uh, never quite made it out there. But uh, I hope to again in the, uh, in the future, uh, assu assuming it uh, returns. But welcome, Lloyd, uh, to the podcast. Finally, good to have you on. Thank you. Thank you so much. Super excited to finally uh, do this together. And uh, just a slight correction is like we, we took over 100 million capital, but um, the bulk of that was uh, credit facility to lend. And then sure. um, the, the rest was growth equity. Gotcha. All right. Appreciate that. So, uh, so Lloyd, Lloyd, tell us a little bit about your, yourself. Like who is Lloyd Lobo? Who, who's Lloyd Lobo? you know, as a person, why did you become an entrepreneur? You know, who are you now? What are you doing? Where are you, etc. So I think, you know, um, a little while ago, my brother helped me realize my true purpose in life. And, and I, I, I was following that journey for a long time, but I didn't realize until he described it. And he said, your true purpose in life is bringing people together. And he's like, even when our families don't hang out, when you're there, people just come together. Wherever you are, whether it's in Dubai or San Francisco or Vancouver, wherever you go, you just bring people together and that's your natural energy. And, uh, and as I started to think and reflect before writing the book, I, I, it goes back way back to me as a kid. My parents grew up in the slums of Mumbai and I was born in Kuwait. My parents moved to Kuwait from India and were working there. And every summer when I'd go there, I'd hang out in the slums and, you know, they made a movie on this, like, probably cement blocks with tin foil roof and uh, my mom had like nine siblings and there was barely enough room for the siblings but every time I'd go there somebody or the other was passing by and staying because Mumbai is New York of India and then I asked my grandfather like why do you have this random person staying and and the general feedback always was the only way to create abundance in life is to help others without expecting anything in return but the the vibe and the camaraderie in that sl slum was such that in, in, in the monsoons, when it was raining in the summer, pond, like uh, those puddles would turn into ponds and we'd all swim together and we'd play together and we'd eat together as a community. Um, very few homes had TVs back then and so TV, watching TV also was a communal thing where people are cooped up in that, uh, <laughs> in that slum and the rest are hanging from the grills outside trying to watch. And then over time, a few years later, um, the Gulf War happened in Kuwait and my first reaction was my, my mom comes and tells me, hey, you can't go to school anymore. My first reaction was, yes, you're never going to find out. <laughs> I failed fourth grade because I'd, I'd been a serial procrastinator, studied for a math exam, ended up being a geography exam. I knew I was going to fail and you know, no fourth grader wants to fail. And she says, you can't go to school. And when I see the worry on her face after it sank in that, yeah, the security in the country had lapsed and you know, we don't know what to do. So that day when I went down the building with my father, I see other concerned faces, and that's what a community is all about, right? You put your hands up and, and say, you know, I have a problem, I have an aspiration, you align with others, and you come forward to do something about it. And literally, there was no cell phones, there was no phones, there was no internet, there was nothing, everything was jammed, and uh, it, was, it was 1990 or 91, I can't remember, but people started self-organizing. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to guard the building from like, eight to 12, you guard it from 12 to four and somebody else is like, I'm gonna organize food supplies and so on and so forth. And that came together in, in a way that every building became a sub community and coordinated with each other, word of mouth spread to embassies and the word got out to the governments and it became one of the largest community led evacuation movements to get people out of the country. And that was, you know, what is entrepreneurship effectively? It's the desire and the drive to take an idea to execution and impact while dealing with extreme uncertainty. And that was my, my sort of uh, affinity towards entrepreneurship or risk rather. I started craving that because 
as I went through my journey, I, I started becoming this person who always took silly risks or, or just walk the fine line, right? And then the other thing I learned there was it validated even more the importance of community because as these refugee buses were leaving Kuwait and going from Kuwait to Baghdad to Jordan on the highway of death, you weren't sure you're going to live or die. Currencies are invalid. You don't know where you're going to land, right? Um, you don't know if your bus is going to get bombed or somebody's going to loot you. But as I looked around the bus, man, I see my parents and other adults who should have been crying were singing and laughing and playing the guitar. And, and that day, probably my core value was formulated. Is It's neither the destination nor the journey, but the companions that matter the most. You could be on a crappy journey on the way to hell, but great companions make it memorable. You could be in Paris ship, sipping champagne and, and eating caviar with toxic people and you'd want to get out of there. Or you could be hanging out in a slum in Mumbai and jumping in a puddle with strangers and having a blast, right? And so that, that those two things became part of my DNA, risk and companionship, like community. And fast forward a few years later, we moved to Canada. I did engineering there, made a lot of good friends. My wife was also a refugee from Kuwait. She got in med school in the US, so I followed her there. And only ever worked at startups, worked at a number of startups. Although I finished engineering, I had asked an entrepreneur, again, risk, think about this, right? What is a safe bet? You finish computer engineering, you go get a job as a computer engineer. I asked an entrepreneur, how could I, how could I be one? What's the best skill? And this person, you know, back then, nobody used the word entrepreneur. It's like a businessman, traditional business person. And he said to me, sales. So I tried to apply for all kinds of sales jobs, and I couldn't get one, right? Who's going to hire like this awkward engineer? So I begged my way into starting at the bottom, cold calling for a small company, and I learned the skills, right? Fast forward today, it's everything I am because of it. Think about it. Communication forms the underlying layer of everything from finding customers to, uh, to, to attracting employees, to evangelizing investors, media, to convincing your wife that startup after startup, let me do another one, right? But it's, it's just not communication, it's evangelizing. And you learn a lot of that when you're selling. You're like effectively pivoting your messaging on the fly, thinking on your feet. A lot of that was, was what I learned. My parents had to hang their head in shame. Think about it. Indian parents, son just finished computer engineering and is getting a job, getting paid $30,000 a year cold calling when their, their friends' kids are like at Microsoft and Google. And so made my journey from cold calling, then worked in sales, then joined another startup where I was to do sales, but they didn't have product market fit. And this is what happens. You go to a lot of startups that raise money. They don't have product market fit and you end up doing everything. So it ended up being like, I became the Renaissance salesperson, meaning talk to customers, figure out what to build, then build it, then, then also figure out the marketing and sales aspect of it and, and how to push it out. So that was my third experience with community actually, because when I was at the startup, I was trying to figure out like, how do I take this thing to market? And this was, I think 2005 or six and Everything was about, all the content was about offline marketing. And I came across HubSpot's inbound marketing certification. So I did all the courses and that was when like Gary V was this chubby guy who had a course on there on video, YouTube video creation and he had Wine TV. And I, I, I like sucked it all in and I started implementing those things as I learned and I started going to HubSpot's meetup. I didn't even know if HubSpot had a product back then, but they had this community of practice around helping people become better digital marketers, better inbound marketers. So I just sucked all that information in and that, that became my community that, uh, around. And then fast forward a few years, you know, only worked at startups that eventually end up failing for whatever reason, they raised money, but they didn't work out. And then I uh, did a couple myself and, uh, and, and then landed on Boast. The Boast journey was my co-founder at Boast, one of my best friends was my partner in every project in university and he called me and said, let's do something together. So he was working in the R&D tax credit space and globally hundreds of billions of dollars are given in research and development tax credits to fund businesses, UK, Australia, France, New Zealand, US, etc. But it's a cumbersome application process. It's prone to frustrating audits and receiving the money takes a long time. So he, he wanted to get out. He was the idea behind it. He, he was championing that. And I was coming from another standpoint. I was working at a startup where I was working till 9, 10, man, every day. And 
my wife was in residency at the time, so she was working 100 hours a week anyway. One week, I started going home at 6, and I get an email from the CEO who says, hey, I used to love it when you're in the office till 9, 10. What's causing you to go home? Your wife is a resident working 100 hours. And man, my heart sank because my parents were visiting from out of town, and I hadn't seen them in a while, right? And as soon as I got home, Alex calls me, and he's like, I think we should do this. And my first reaction was, man, I'll do whatever as long as I don't have to work in this environment, as long as we can build a company we want to work for. So fast forward a number of years, Alex and I did a startup in 2013, which was automatically, which was a chatbot built on top of Zendesk when people mm -hmm. didn't even know what chatbots were. That didn't work out. A lot of learnings there that, that I can share. Then I joined the founding team of a company incubated by Bessemer. We were building a sales assistant for AI-driven sales assistant to help people guide them through the selling process on the call and then update their CRM and generate the next set of action items. This was 2015, man. So ahead of its times, didn't work out, ran out of that money. And then on this, we also had Boast running as a consulting firm, which was Boast Capital Consulting, which was already tax credit consulting. And 2017, we said, hey, you know, we've tried other projects, but this is, this is it, right? We can just automate this with our learnings and blow it up. So 2017, we incorporated Boast capital as boast AI and we had paying customers that we were offering a manual service to and so we knew that we could just put them on software we knew exactly what process we were doing the manual work with right and this is where most people don't start is talk to customers figure out their pain point offer to do the service manually you have no buttons or widgets to hide because customers want an outcome they don't want software so no outcome no customer you'll understand exactly what you're doing and then you can leverage no code, low code tools to build iterations. Like if you're collecting data, then leverage APIs. Then you got to normalize that data. Then you got to do workflow on it. And so our first version of Boast was Zapier with uh, Zoho Creator. And then that turned into software, right? And so, so that was the journey. But the thing was after trying to build and get customers and all the other startups that raised money that failed, Boast was like, hey, we had customers that were paying us and we were solving a key pain point. Now let's latch onto that and automate that process and then go on that journey. So fast forward from 2017 when we incorporated Boast AI, which was previously we were running a consulting firm called Boast Capital, to 2020, we went to eight figures in revenue and through our traction community, which I'll talk about in a sec here. Yeah. Uh, the, these, uh, this growth equity firm, Radiant Capital in New York, had come to the event. They reached out to me and said, hey, uh, we really love the event. It seems like you have access to a lot of potential founders we could invest in. Would you be interested in joining our venture partner network? And my first reaction was, hey, this is like a community thing we do on the side. I have a business to run. I don't think I can you know, send you deals law in exchange for carry. Yeah. And then they started getting interested in what the business does. And because like we weren't raising, like Alex, my co-founder, Romanian background, grew up in Canada, also very focused on like, hey, control your own destiny and, and don't be frivolous with money, right? That's the immigrant lifestyle. If, if you can turn one into three, then take money. Otherwise, don't be frivolous with money. And, and why do you want to bring on other partners that you don't know because it's a long marriage building a company? So that he was the voice of reason on the other side, like Vivi, my, my wife was a voice of reason in the sense, if you go and force Alex and your team and everyone, cause I'm, I'm always bouncing off the walls. Alex is like a calm one. It's like, if you, mm -hmm. if you like will this fundraising into existence and it becomes somebody's zero sum game and it fails, then you have to go to like Oracle or Salesforce, like just find a stable job. And so, so when these guys came in, I'm like, Hey, listen, we're not raising right. And we're not interested. But uh, thank you. And then, you know, they, they really love the business, though, because it's like, hey, you're selling $100 bills for $20. You have recurring revenue, great gross margins, and a clean cap table with effectively no marketing spend. And, and I'll dive into how no marketing spend. We got to eight mm -hmm. figures in revenue with literally no marketing spend or no marketing team. And then they said, hey, listen, we're not traditional VCs. And I'm like, so what are you, PE? And like, you know, we all hear about the PE hustle where you go through like six months of due diligence and get all these earnouts and nothing works out and now you've lost your company. And so they're like, no, we're this growth equity, which is we behave like VC, 
but we we have expectations a little bit like P. So they're in between. So like we'll invest in you if you have good metrics, we'll let you cash out while still owning a good chunk of the company so you play the long game. You're de-risking the short game so you can play the long game. And we don't have these obscene things like you have to grow triple, triple, double, 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 and potentially kill the business in, in the bargain, but like grow capital efficiently. And I'm like, what? The first thing I latched onto money off the table. I'm like, what? Really? I'm going to be rich? <laughs> because uh, imagine coming from like families that, that yeah. hadn't seen that kind of money on both sides, right? Um, and so it was relieving after especially like 10 years of grinding through different uh, startups. And so that was the journey. And then we did that deal uh, late 2020 and then followed, uh, you know, for our customers, we raised a hundred million credit facility. And then me and my co-founder in the year following transition made way for a new CEO who used to be the CTO of Sage Intact. But yeah, that is the quick recap journey. Thanks for that. And it's a, if, quite a, if, a few questions there. But so what, whilst then running, running Boast, which, which you successfully exited, but are still uh, on the board with, you also started Traction, you know, at, at some point. But like, I guess what, why do Traction, why build this community, run the, run the conference whilst you're also building a, a startup, right? Because it's, it's like you're running two companies uh, here. Uh, but I, I get, it, uh, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, I'm just, as I'm hearing your story, uh, am I thinking that, you know, traction on, on the one hand could be a good, you know, opportunity, you know, for marketing for Boast in, into that and elevating Boast? Or is it, again, listen to your story right from the beginning. I mean, you, you, you come from, community right and you're all about community and bringing people together so is it just like this passion project i want to get people together i want to help them learn it was a combination of it was a it was a combination so the way i look at it is traction to boast was what inbound was to hubspot and inbound is to yep. hubspot or pulse is to gain side so what happened was when we started boast i was in san francisco my co-founder was in calgary and if we started with like a small market because you're bootstrapping, you can't go big or go home, right? Mm -hmm. So I moved in temporarily in Calgary. We started off a spare bedroom. And now we're like cold calling. What is the first thing you'll do? You cold call, you'll send cold emails, right? Like you don't have access. And very quickly realize that, you know, you're asking people for their product development data so you can get them access to government funding. What are people going to tell you when, you, when, you, when I cold call you and I, and I say that or cold email? They're like, one, it sounds shady. Two, I don't even know who you guys are because we don't have any connections in common on LinkedIn and you guys sound, look like a bunch of noobs. And, and so we were running into a lot of friction um, in terms of converting high value clients. So one of the immediate things was, hey, you know, we're founders who haven't been successful and we need to learn how to get first customers, how to grow our business, how to... You do marketing, a hundred things you need to learn, right? And, and, you know, the one thing we had was access to successful founders as a function of being in and around startups who we could invite. And so we started honing on this ICP. We started first, what we started doing was you're we like, hey, what is the ICP, the ideal customer profile we want to target? Because we called manufacturing companies and called technology companies and startups. It was just hard. And the bigger the company, the harder it was to get their mind share. Because again, if you're accessing government funding and tax credits, you can go work with big four accounting firms, which was the norm back then. So why would you work with two guys out of, you know, who you don't know? And so we're like, okay, let's hone in. What is the bet you're gonna make, right? Well, let's hone in on the startup market. And we said, we're gonna go after that market. Now, a lot of competitors are laughing because they're like, you know, it's silly, right? You're unstable businesses, you're gonna go out of businesses. But fast forward today, it's the fastest growing, right? Brex exist and, SVB and all these companies started startup programs just to target that market because it's a good beachhead. You grow with them if you help mm -hmm. them, right? Fall in love with your customer and make them su successful beyond your product or service because if they grow, you'll grow with them. Mercury has done this extremely well, right? In, in the banking space. But a lot of uh, push we got was, why are you going after this market if you can't go and sell to like big companies, big tech or, or, um, or manufacturing or like just bigger companies? then you should just fold because this is gonna be a stupid two-person business. Now, a lot of success in life is just comes from being contrarian and being right, <laughs> right? Uh, because if it was not contrarian 
everyone else would do it. And so we said, we started swarming all the startup events. We went and participated in startup weekends and like just trying to understand and be visible. A lot of what you eventually become is visibility, credibility, and then profitability. Right? You just go out there and, and create a bunch of noise and add value and become credible and then people buy from you. So we started going to all these events in, in Calgary and all these meetups and we realized very quickly that a lot of these events at the time people were talking a lot of high-level stuff. This is like pre-Saster. This is pre-Boast AI existed. This was when mm -hmm. Boast, AI, Boast AI was actually Boast uh, Capital Consulting was offering the service manually. We hadn't even, we barely had any customers maybe, right? So just validating the market. And um, you know, there was no Saster back then. There was no super tactical content. And we said, hey, we know, we know founders. We'll invite them to come and speak at a meetup and uh, we'll invite our prospects who are like us. Now the thesis went from being buy my shit, like buy my stuff, to saying, hey, X, hey founder, we're bringing speaker X to talk on topic Y. Only 10 seats are there. Would love to have you join us. It's gonna be free pizza. We call them pizza nights, right? And who wouldn't go to that, right? We're getting the brand rub now. We, we found speakers who are not the sort of the biggest names, but hmm. mid-sized names who are of influence to any startup founder. And so first meetup, 10 people came, second meetup, like 15, 20, and that grew and grew. And one day, I think we had like Saeed Amiri from Plug and Play come. We did a launch event with them and a bunch of talks and 200 people showed up to that pizza event in the co-working space. Now you can imagine what the co-working space guys will tell you. This hmm. is not a freaking pizza night. <laughs> This is a freaking conference. So many conferences. And over, yeah, yeah. So over time, uh, that conference evolved into a community and turned into traction, uh, and that was the journey. But but really, you know, the the key learning there was a lot of times when you're starting out, especially when you're bootstrapped, you don't have access to a lot of capital to try different things. Like I can't run infinite number of ads. Right and, and yes, you can say PLG is great, but it takes a lot of time and a lot of research and a lot of UX gymnastics and really honing in the problem and building to get PLG right. I did Speakeasy was a PLG company. We got 10, we failed with like 10,000 users. It, it, like it takes a long time. You know, you always start with a small subset and solve for either your personal problem and make it perfect for you, like maybe Slack's team did, or make it, or, and, then, and then expand to small subsets of people and watch how they use and adopt like onboarding, activation, engagement, retention, before you like explode it, right? And so it's, it's, it's hard to do with, uh, with PLG, so you, when you don't have money. On, on building the community, on building traction, what, what percentage of customers would you say Boast AI got from, from those efforts of building the community? Yeah, so, so going, going back to that, right, it's, it's a very hard attribution, but in the early mm. days, like our, we had this one-two punch going because I was doing, I brought the first several customers, at least for the first almost a year, and my job was going out there in the community and making noise, shaking hands, kissing babies. Eventually, when we hired salespeople, they adopted the same formula. Either go to events, partner and co-host events, or do your own events, shake hands, kiss babies, and build relationships. So what you're doing at this point though, is now you're going out there and adding value to the community. This is a time where like even LinkedIn wasn't a big thing, right? Like people now need advice, they need help. So you are being a broker of resources. And the way to do this, once you hone in your, your ICP, right? You understand now what are the aspirations, the goals, so that you can help them beyond your product or service. Then you figure out like who are the influencers that they look up to? What are the tools and services they would pay for, they would need? And where do they hang out, right? Like what blogs, magazines they read? So then it became natural. We, we wrote down those lists with a circle of influence around our ideal customer profile, which is a founder like us. And we started inviting all those people they followed to come speak at our events. Then we knew people read TechCrunch. We'd invite TechCrunch and Forbes and VentureBeat to come and moderate those sessions over time. And Frederic Lardinua from TechCrunch comes to every single event. So now, and, and then like for sponsors and that, we reach out to all the 
providers of tools like accountants, bankers, sure, but then also like the intercoms of the world. And so now when a founder comes to this event back then, they're like, I'm in my tribe. I see like the CEO of Twilio and I see intercom sponsoring and I see TechCrunch. This is the crowd I want to be a part of. And, and that, you know, changed our vision or our purpose from saying automating tax credits to actually helping innovators change the world. And it sounds cheesy, but having a big purpose that's your forever is very important. A lot of times what we do as founders is we latch on to the, the now, right, which is what your product does. But customers don't want your products. They want an outcome. So why do they want funding to grow their, to, to accelerate R&D? Why do they want to accelerate R&D to grow their business, to drive some further downstream impact? And so we latched onto that purpose, and that helped our product evolve from automating R&D credits to then lending against R&D by, by raising this capital facility. And then now the product we're launching is R&D analytics, which is we collect interesting data from your technical systems and financial systems. To lend to you, we need to collect your banking data. So we know now a 360 score of your business. Like, you know, traditionally R&D has been a black box, but sales is not. So how can I say that the R&D money you're spending can turn into tangible outcomes. So we're launching an R&D analytics product which tells you who you should hire, what projects you should invest in, yada, yada, yada. So that early customers honestly just came from the community. So now think about it. We built the circle of influence, right? In one way or the other, the partners we met as a function of those events, like lawyers, bankers, accountants, right? We have all those partnerships formulated. So whether somebody came to our event and directly converted, and this is the problem with community you probably face. It's very hard mm. to do one-to-one -one attribution, right? So think about the flow here. You may invite like people to an event. Somebody comes to the event, they like it, or maybe they come to an online webinar, they forward it to somebody on the team. Somebody on the team likes it, maybe forwards it to another person. That person goes to the website and downloads a white paper, and then they get a call by the SDR and it gets marked SDR. This is the problem with community attribution. And you know, I had a chat with Atlassian's chief revenue officer. He's like, how do you do community attribution? Your, your community self-organized 5,000 events last year. It's like, I don't care about <laughs> attribution. It works itself out. But yeah. what, what felt was more people were coming to the events. Every event had more and more people. And the relationships with the community got stronger. Like our salespeople were like seen now more like brokers of resources. Oh, you know what? They're a trusted advisor. If I mm -hmm. need an accountant, a banker, a lawyer, VC connection, whatever, I'm going to call the both guys. They're going to make an yeah. intro for me. And that's what was happening. And so we built referral partnerships. We built partnerships with incubators, accelerators. We one way or the other through the community, whether it's direct deal flow, and a lot of people miss this point. The community is not just mining that community for leads, it's the relationships you build. And then when you're that broker of resources and you go and say, hey, Alex, um, I understand you're looking to raise a Series A um, and, and you, know, you need these five things. You need like, you know, you need a good, if you're gonna raise a Series A, you need to have your financials in a row, right? And you're, you're gonna be like, yeah, you know what? I've never really had a proper CFO and I know I need to have all of these things in a certain format. So I make a connection for you. And I make two, three, two or three other, other connections for you. Then I can subtly ask him like, hey, do you have somebody taking care of your R&D credits? And they may say, you know, yeah, uh, but you know what? They don't do anything else for me, but you guys are adding so much value. Why don't I just work for you, work with you? And that was starting to happen a lot. So very casually, you're like, do something for them and just ask. We're like, you don't have to work with us, but hey, we offer this too. If, um, if it's, uh, you know, if, if you see us doing a good service for you. And they immediately think, right, you added so much value to me for free. Why won't I pay and get your service? And that started to happen. The social proof from the speakers, the social proof from uh, the partners who are coming to the events, and the social proof from us adding value to them beyond like just saying buy my stuff started to proliferate. And that's what I look at community being, right, is helping each other beyond the product or service. A hundred percent. And, and, and I think and focusing then on, on boast and I, I guess the, the, the growth equity that you raised, which was 23 million, like after bootstrapping to 10 million ARR and congrats, so, you know, no, no easy feat, right? Was it a very difficult decision or was it an easy decision to, to go with the, with, with, with the growth equity, like did your, your conversation with your co-founder, did you say, hey man, like, you know, any conversations, we're gonna build this to a hundred million or was it like, look, you know, like, 
what was it what was the thought process and um yeah just curious this happened in the middle of pandemic right mm. and the one thing we knew for sure that the pandemic was creating a lot of artificial growth for a lot of people think about it, it was a time that everyone needed to go and transact online you needed zoom you needed shopify you needed snowflake you needed twilio you needed yeah. sendgrid you needed everything the business stopped and so a lot of money was pouring in and there was a lot of vc interest for us and only like one growth equity firm who can come to our event. Now the VC thing is worrisome because think about it. Yes, we started Boast AI in 2017, but prior to that it was Boast Capital as a consulting firm. And then we worked on together collectively on two other things, right? Two other startups while also building traction. Mm -hmm. So we were like, at this point is like, is there a light at the end of the tunnel? And so the, the clean decision was, we'll sacrifice a massive valuation to de-risk ourselves financially, mm -hmm. right? Because it was game-changing money for two founders, right? It was game-changing money. And uh, now think about it. Like, that kind of money is, is game-changing in the sense that you've not seen it and it can, it can de-risk you. And at the yeah. same time, because we were bootstrapped, and despite selling 52 or 53% of the company, we still own nearly 40% of the company and on the board. So it, was, it, it made a lot of sense. And I think the key thing there, the key motivator was, can we de-risk ourselves? So when I, when, when I had that conversation, I brought it to Alex. I mean, he, I was president, he's CEO, he's a core decision maker there. Anything, especially anything financial related that way. And... Um, his initial reaction always to venture was like, listen, man, why do you want to give a part of your company and bring on like, it's like, it's like bringing on another partner into your marriage and having to deal with that dynamics. And, and when, when he heard this growth equity pitch, he was calm and he was actually excited. He said, I think we should go on this journey. And for me, that was a great signal. I respect Alex a lot. One of the smartest people I know and when he said that, I'm like, you know what? It's just not me bouncing over walls, right? So the thing is, you always need two people in a company. Like a CEO, mm -hmm. founder CEO, is somebody who stabilizes the business. You need another co-founder who injects new risk in the business, right? Bouncing yeah. off the walls. I was the face of the company injecting more risk in the business because you take one or two of those bets and they, they play off, right? Mm -hmm. and, and then you need somebody also reining things in otherwise it'll explode and so we had this very very good partnership between us since college and then on the other end my wife was like lloyd let's just do like a quick math check here you're the only person i know who's only worked at startups <laughs> their entire life like you've never had a regular job since you graduated has any has any one of those founders ever made money and i'm like no so she's like if you go and listen to all these venture noise, this growth equity seems smart. Don't try to like rock the boat by trying to convince Alex and other, like, you know, that you got to raise venture. I know the valuation seems high, but your math itself says it's not going to work. Yeah. So if you take at a high valuation and you're forced to grow faster and things break, which they always do, by the way, even if you're not growing faster, if you take external capital and try to do new things, things break. And, and you take it to zero, then you're going to have to get a job at a stable company like Oracle or Salesforce. And I'm like, okay, you know what? This makes sense. And then I had a couple of conversations with the, with the Radiant Capital guys, one of their uh, team members, partners who's on our board, Chris Livingston, fantastic human being. He was in San Francisco and that was the time um, during COVID that it was open. Like we, we, we caught a lucky window basically, mm. right? It, it was open and, and we hung out. But think about it, man. Founders ignore, a lot of people ignore a couple things. They ignore the value of the companions around them, the network around them that do them favors, number one. And number two, they ignore the influence of luck. Now think about, we didn't do that deal. We raised an obscene round of money, right? We could have raised maybe 50, 60 million at an obscene valuation and the market cratered two years later. Not only would I be not cashed out, but the other thing is now I'd be like struggling because we have one or two competitors in the space that after us, they went the venture route, raised at very high valuations. They literally came up right after us. Mm -hmm. And now their valuation is like 10% of what they raised at. So you be end up becoming a zombie company, right? Because if you raise any more, you give up your whole cap table. So, so then how do the founders stay motivated? 
So we made the right decisions thanks to Alex, and thanks to my wife like telling me not to sway <laughs> things too much. And, um, and, and it, was, it was the right one. But think about this, Alex. If the pandemic window hadn't opened, that small window in July, and we hadn't hosted that traction meetup, and, the, and these guys also were recommended by an incubator who said, hey, we know these growth equity investors. Do you want to give them a slot on the panel? I didn't know them. I'm like, yeah, sure. If that wouldn't have happened, they didn't have a good experience at the community event, didn't call me. Probably none of this would have happened, right? It's luck plays. Luck is the 10% that tips the 90% in your favor. We ignore luck a lot. Luck is... Yeah there's a lot of luck in everything and that luck has enabled me to take the time off and do nothing for a little bit right and that answers or my question is what are you doing at the moment but we'll or maybe it doesn't but we'll come back to that and just conscious of time because i want to ask you a little bit about your book before we go into the or the upcoming book before we go into the quick fire round so you've got a book coming out in september what's it called you, you know what, why did you write this and you know who's it for Definitely. So, you know, I, I walked through my journey, right? Slums with my grandparents, mm -hmm. Gulf War refugee, then, you know, the HubSpot community that helped me learn as an engineer everything about marketing and leveled up my game where I could actually communicate <laughs> with some polish. And then bootstrap boast with the traction community. In between when things we're just starting to go good. Uh, we lost a child uh, four months in. We were expecting twins. We lost a child and uh, had to pull the other one uh, five months early. And, uh, and so my wife and I relied on a, a large community of physician moms when we were looking at other kids in the NICU pass, right? And, and that mm. was the daily sort of hope, right? Seeing other parents and what they did and how now they have thriving and surviving babies. And then when I left the day-to-day -day at Boast, I became depressed, man. Like, so think about it, right? When you are a front-facing founder, your identity is the company. And when you leave, you just are lost. You don't know what to do. And I actually got depressed because what, what, ended, what ended up happening, this was the journey. All my life, I didn't really have much money. And uh, for whatever it's worth, and this is the funniest thing, my mother-in-law never thought I was good enough to marry my wife. My wife got into med school in second year of undergrad without entrance exams, without MCATs is what they call in the US. My actually, my wedding was called off two days prior <laughs> in India. And, uh, and then nine months later, we willed that wedding into existence. And I learned, to, I learned to be good at events from planning that wedding and my experience mm -hmm. helping my dad coordinate during the Gulf War. And, and so gave her the dream wedding. And I told her every week, and this was goosebumps for my whole family that I would retire at 40, okay? July hit, and I kept saying, July now during the pandemic, my wife's like, listen, it's July, okay? Like, stop saying this nonsense. We're in the middle of the pandemic, and you're like, every time there's something, you're like, yeah, I'm going to retire at 40. She's like, you're three months away from being 40. How is this going to happen? I kid you not, man. That wire hit my bank the week of my 40th birthday, okay? And, and... But through this journey, I hadn't spent time with my kids. I have a nine-year-old now and um, a five-year-old and a two-year-old. He wasn't born then when this, when this deal happened. Mm -hmm. And during the due diligence process during COVID was also a time where, you know, we had to take one of the, the big traction conference offline. And we moved everything from doing one big conference to doing two live webinars a week, not even a virtual summit because a virtual summit, one yeah. and done. Two yep. live webinars a week, each week, five, 600 people are tuning in. Mm -hmm. So much stress, no resources, of course. So I'm like doing the edits myself, plus managing partnerships, plus product, like a lot of stuff, right? If everyone mm -hmm. is like, like Alex is juggling five balls, I'm juggling five balls. And, and then the, we got thrown into this due diligence. And now as a bootstrap company, you don't have salesforce.com, you're using like the cheapest tool. So it elongated the due diligence process. And my wife would always say, dude, you spend no time with us. Like the kids are calling you uncle already. Like if something happens, you're not going to care. And I said, let the deal go through. I will take everyone to Bora Bora. Trust me. And she's like, nobody cares about your Bora Bora. We will care phones, phones down time with you. Anyway, the deal went through. We booked everyone to Bora Bora. Two days before the Bora Bora trip, I got bilateral COVID pneumonia and I was hospitalized. Mm. I was on oxygen my wife freaked out. She called my co-founder and started crying. 
she rarely cries. I mean, she's an ER doc. Came back from that experience and I said, you know what, I'll spend more time with the family. But we went into this journey of Lloyd is a single point of failure kind of thing, right? I, yeah. I did a bunch of things. So we started replacing my roles. I started to feel lost in the company. Again, COVID chaos with like, you know, dealing with that brain fog coupled with the company was hiring at such a rapid pace. We went like, imagine eight figure revenue at 40 ish or so people, or maybe less plus mm -hmm. minus to now, like in a span of eight months in 2021, we went to like over a hundred and like, I'm also dealing with the chaos of like, you know, we have a new CTO and I had a product, which I was doing. We have a new CMO, which I was doing. Like the partnerships person reports the CMO, I was doing partnership. So all these things were happening, this dynamics. And I started to just, I, I couldn't make sense of anything. And then what happened was, I was not gelling with the big, big company execs that we had brought in because I'm a zero to one guy. I'm a pirate, right? Yeah. I like to do things a certain way and I wasn't gelling. And, um, and, and then, uh, August of 21, my daughter comes to me and she was, I think, seven or eight at the time. And she's like, listen, dad, you've gotten worse. You promised after COVID you'd spend more time with us. And I said, sweetie, we've got so many more people. We want to make sure things are on the right track so we do right by them. And she says, why don't you go and work for somebody who thinks like that so I can have my dad back? Hmm. And my heart sank. A couple of weeks later, I'm at an offsite in Austin with Alex. And my phone is down and I pick it up few hours later and there's like 20 missed calls and my wife's good friend calls me and says you asshole you've done this for the third time she's in labor and you're nowhere in sight hmm. now all the flights for the day had gone so i'd take the morning flight i barely made it to see the birth of uh, my third kid and then i walk into a board meeting saying <laughs> you gotta fire all these execs like with a lot of emotion losing my mind like kind of thing and, and basically the reaction was, listen, calm down. You had a terrible year. You almost died of COVID chaos of so many people, all these things, you just had a kid. Why don't you take opportunity leave? And yeah. We'll figure it out when you're back. No matter how good the financial outcome for a founder, your baby is your baby, right? Like yeah. if you sacrificed everything, it is your baby. It was the baby before my babies. It was always right. And so then you, you, you think through like in your case, if you had a kid and somebody says, I'll pay you all the costs to raise that kid but I need to do a, you know, I need to decide how that operates. What are you going to feel, right? You may have cashed out and felt good, but eventually it's, it's going to be hard, right? And, and, and I realize now all of our problems are nothing but attachment. And so I came home that day and, and, and I hugged my wife and I cried for 10 minutes and I said, I'm, I'm really sorry for all the times you needed me and I put the company first and I wasn't there and today the company doesn't need me and you're the only person standing. And I end up being depressed, man. Like despite having financial freedom, I was depressed. And I started like just calling random people who are friends and flying them here and there and showing up at different places and, and just partying. And my wife let me have my peace because she knew what, what I was going through. And I kid you not, you know, the Texylvania conference in, in Romania, <laughs> I was there and uh, it was the after, not the after party, they had the speaker event and I was there at like 2 a.m. We're in the middle of nowhere, four hours from Bucharest and everyone's ready to sleep at 2 a.m. and I'm frantically calling the Uber. And they're like, what are you doing? I said, I got a call from a bunch of my friends who are hanging out in Costa Rica and I got a jet to Costa Rica. They're like, what, are you crazy? How are you gonna get to the airport? What time's the flight? I'm like 6.30 and it's 2 a.m. And uh, finally I get an Uber because in the middle of nowhere and the Uber shows up. When the Uber shows up, I'm like, can you halt a few minutes? I pull out my laptop and I book the ticket to Costa Rica right there. And I get on. That's how crazy I went. Yeah. Right. I, I, I was literally hopping from place to place. And then finally my wife looks at me one day and she's like, Lloyd, look at you. You're overweight. You're like insufferable. You've gotten 100x worse when, than you were working at Boast. She's like, don't, what is wrong with you? Like you're latching onto something you don't have, but you're ignoring everything you have. You have the freedom, the time you can go and live anywhere. Why are you doing this to yourself? If something happens to you, your kids are going to be left holding the bag and you might not get a second chance given you almost died of COVID. And, and that day was my probably sixth or seventh big experience with the community is I looked across the room. I was like, you know, something, a light bulb went on. And I see my Peloton bike, which had turned into a makeshift towel rack for like three years. <laughs> I hopped on 
And I felt instant connection with the instructor because she brought her vulnerable self and she was coming yeah. off maternity leave and she says, hey, I'm feeling weak, I can't ride. And then she yells out, self-pity is toxic. One click, one ride, one uh, walk, one crank, one shift. I am, I can with like Rocky's Eye of the Tiger playing. And that one ride turned into two, into four. And my fitness journey and my transformation started from there. And there's a post I made that's, that's tagged on my LinkedIn, like yeah, my, my transformation journey. And then we end up moving to Dubai because I think, you know, we wanted a change in environment. A lot of sometimes what we do is we rely on medication and meditation and masturbation being like euphemism for everything else you do but you don't address the root cause of the, the depression. And I think what was, was was the environment I lived in in Silicon Valley was all founders, entrepreneurs, and everyone was like, when are you gonna do the next thing? And unicorn, and this is just a small cash out. It, you know, you gotta do the next thing and bigger. And so we end up ejecting to Dubai. We had a lot of friends and family. We'd been spending time here every so often, every year. And we came here uh, to disconnect. And now when I had all this free time, I thought to myself, Every critical part in my journey, there's been a common theme. It's the community. And I have all this free time if I sit and do nothing because I'm not used to doing nothing. I've always worked so long. What's the best thing I can do is, is spread the message of community. And I started like going through all the traction interviews. And like we had like probably four or 500 interviews, started going through all of them, finding common themes, reaching out to community members and asking the same questions over and over and over and, and then decided to write this book because I ended up finding 13 common themes amongst all the, the, the brands, big or small, that went from mm -hmm. like obscure to successes. And I found these 13 common rules and I said, I'm gonna put, put it together in a book because you know, we're in 2023 where marketing is taking a bloodbath. CPMs are up. Generative AI has made content so same. I mean, initially it was feeling different, but now you can you know exactly who's copy pasting from, from chat GPT. And, and, I, and I started to, to see that, you know, some of the biggest iconic brands out there were built on communities like Harley Davidson almost went bankrupt in the 80s when the Japanese manufacturers came in. They made community not a marketing strategy, a business strategy. They rebuilt right. the company on the ethos of community you know a Harley Davidson fan from what they're wearing today. They, that community rescued the company. It also created movements to donate to breast cancer and whatnot. Or you look at someone like Mr. Beast, right? Like his community has come together to raise 30 million, to pull out 30 million pounds of plastic from the ocean. Or you look at HubSpot, or you look at Nike, which really focus on the aspiration. And so when I started to find this common theme which, I mean, Boast was a small success, but there was a common theme in how we built communities and how we built the community and these big brands took it further was falling in love with the customer and making them successful beyond the product or service. Like Nike has this running club. And so I wanted to put that together and say, it's not technology or products. It's about people. People drive businesses because ultimately yesterday's innovation always becomes today's option and tomorrow's commodity, the GPS. It was hard to get a hands on. And then it became an option in every vehicle. And today there's Apple CarPlay, right? And so, but if you build a community, you won't become a commodity. And that is the journey of Apple to Harley Davidson, to Nike and every other big brand. And so I said, you know what? There's a lot of personal stories here that I can get out of the system while also telling the story of hundreds of community-led businesses and share that community-led growth is a viable st company strategy, not a marketing strategy, but a viable company strategy to drive your PLG, to drive your early customer acquisition, to drive your customer success and long-term sustainable uh, moats. I mean, great, great stuff there. Like, it makes sense. So I think with, uh, I've thought about it in the past as well, given that I've been podcasting for eight years, with all the, the, the great interviews that we've done and, uh, the, you know, finding the commonalities and they, there's probably a book in there, there somewhere, but I think it's really good to, to, to kind of share that from having done that hard work. Other people, I think, you know, have done similar like Tim Ferriss, et cetera, with his tools, tools of the Titans. Um, but where, where can people get the book or when can they get it? Where can they get it? Definitely. We'll have it for pre-order. Uh, 
probably in the next few days, so the week of the 21st for pre-order. And then the release is September 17th. It is on from grassroots to greatness.com. And you can follow me on LinkedIn, Lloyd, double L-O-Y-E-D. There's an E in my name and I'll tell you why in a second, but Lloyd Lobo. My mom, I, I asked her uh, not too long ago that why did you put this E in my name? Because it's so confusing to everyone. <laughs> everyone makes a mistake. I got like yeah. bullied and made fun of. And she said, I always wanted you to be an entrepreneur. And I thought if you became an entrepreneur, you would never be able to trademark a name with just Lloyd. So I threw an E in there so it would be unique. <laughs> the, e is, the E is for entrepreneur in Lloyd, right? Uh, for sure. You know, that's, and, a, that's the first person I know that has told me that. That yeah. is great. Thank you. Yeah. No, no, I mean, I, I think it's, it's probably true. And, and also, I mean, in terms of write, writing the book, it was great that you shared the, the, the lessons of the, these great brands and people that you've spoken with. But from listening to you, 100%, the, your, your life story, you know, is, is a book waiting to happen so perhaps the next one it's, it's you sharing your story because there's so many great lessons there for sure it's it's really kind of fascinating to to hear so i expect to see that at some point we're going to move quickly into the quick fire round so we're going to go quickly kind of through this and and, and then before we kind of wrap up just uh, conscious of time there so lloyd let me ask you what one thing has moved the needle the most for you in your career one, the only thing that's moved the needle for me in the biggest way is people. It's, it's companions, it's network. I know it's an overused term. Your network is your net worth. Mm -hmm. But trust me, it's the best way to engineer privilege is you, you, you may not have a network or you may not have influence, but if you create influence, you will, it'll just the compound interest on creating that influence, giving, giving, helping, bringing people together over time is is you're gonna you're gonna have everything you want like if you help enough people get what they want you'll get everything you want that's that's the one the biggest needle mover i am not special by any means i don't even work that hard but the one thing i do is invest a lot in relationships and i'll give you mm -hmm. one very perfect example um i also believe that if you really admire somebody go and do stuff for them now a lot of people will tell you that why should I mentor you? You have no experience. And if I'm, if, even if you do free work for me, it's actually costing me mm -hmm. my time. So don't do that. Don't say I'll do free work for you. Actually identify a problem they have and go do it for them on your dime without taking their input. Just go and do it for them. Yeah. That's how I built a relationship with Jason Lemkin. He had, I had invited him to speak at a conference that our first conference, I think, in San Francisco. And he interviewed Ryan Smith and he was amazed how by cold calling we got all these speakers mm -hmm. then i offered to help him and i chased him if i could help him with saster and i saw that uh, the sales and marketing party that they were hosting was like falling apart because the person organizing had just backed off the week before so i said don't worry i don't need anything from you i'm going to organize it i found the venue i found sponsors and 900 or a thousand people showed up to that party and then we started building relationships and it's at a point right now where jason wrote the forward on my book he also asked me to join the board of his company which i which i recently joined all mm -hmm. that from just taking the first step like figure out if somebody has a problem and don't say can i help you just freaking do it and if you do that two or three times recipro reciprocation is a real thing they will do or the society or, or the universe will do for you without you even asking what is the hardest thing about being a founder i think the hardest thing about being a founder is the personal side of the equation and if i could do it again i'd live more intentionally because you get pulled in all these directions like shareholder return customers employees all of these things making money and your family suffers a lot man and if i could ever do it again what i would think is design the life i want to live and build a company around it build mm -hmm. my personal definition of success and a, and a great founder jafar Ovenadi, who built a, a, um, he's, he's the founder of poppy right now and previously he he did lupio he he gave me these questions which were very helpful is what is your personal definition of success how much money do you want in your bank in your bank account is there a version of the company you don't want to work for um, is there an argument for raising money or not now and why? And those were very important for me. And, you know, I fought the decision to not leave the day-to-day -day at Boast. And when we were moving to Dubai, I found my journal and I'd written those questions. And there was a number I wrote for how much money I want in my bank account. And I wrote, there's a version of a company that I don't want to work for, which is I'm a zero to one guy. And anytime it's like, you know, large enterprise people in there, when it gets to that level, I don't want, that's not my jam. Yeah. The thing is, 
I didn't see that, but even if I saw it, I'd probably fought it. I had to go through that journey to get to the answer. But through COVID, through all these emotional things that the, I felt like the universe was trying to tell me that enough is enough. You, you hit those numbers, those benchmarks you had written down years ago. What about the best advice you've ever received? The best advice I ever received was play the long game in SaaS. It compounds. Larry Ellison is the single most richest person in SaaS because he never sold a share. And Warren Buffett, one of the richest people in the world because the law of compound interest. And that was from Jason Lemkin. And, cool. and the other thing, he, he, very similar to that, he said about communities, always add one big piece of value and one small piece of value every year to your community and keep doing that year after year after year. And just like SaaS revenue, it'll compound as well. Now, not, not only is this the first time that you've come on the the SaaS Revolution uh, podcast, but you'll also be speaking at SaaS Talk in Dublin uh, this October. And so delighted that you, you'll be joining us there also for the first time. Any, any thoughts yet? Might be a little bit early about what you'll be speaking about or what you're looking forward to in you know, coming both to SaaS Talk and Dublin. Definitely. I'm looking to hang out in person. Also, I, I love you guys' logo, very similar to my From Grassroots to Greatness logo as well. So we, we have similar vibes. Okay. I, I love your energy. I want to check out Dublin. I've never been. And so I'm, I'm really stoked for that. And I think what, I, what I'll talk about is probably like 11 unconventional uncon ways or you know, I like the odd number, 11 unconventional yeah. ways to bootstrap to 10 million ARR. Probably Very cool. Well, like looking that. forward to that and, uh, and, and meeting you in person in, in Dublin and having a pint of Guinness. Uh, hopefully as well. Well, Lloyd, thank you so much for being a great guest on the SaaS Revolution show today. You know, fantastic story, you know, great success. You know, really appreciate you sharing that being an open and honest book. So thank you so much, Lloyd Lobo, for being a guest on the show today. Thank you so much, Alex. I'm looking forward to meeting in person. Mm -hmm.